and welcome to everyone. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm editor at large of The Hill, and it's a real pleasure to be here today, uh, really performing facilitating role on behalf of New America's Health Innovations Lab and its international security program. Our topic for the day uh, is to discuss the future of healthcare in a post-COVID world. We have two of the most outstanding thinkers and commentators we could have on this. First, we have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, sorry, Rear, Rear Admiral Susan Blumenthal, uh, also Dr. Doctor Health Innovations Lab, and she's a senior fellow at Health, Health Policy at New America. She's a former U.S. Assistant Surgeon General, former uh, first Deputy Assistant Secretary for Women's Health, the first one uh, in that role. She was clinical professor at Tufts and Georgetown University Schools of Med Medicine, and she's a visiting professor at the MIT Media Lab, and she's a good friend of of mine. It's a real honor to be here uh, with Dr. Blumenthal. And then we're honored to have uh, Dr. Shantanu, um, Shantanu Nundi, who is the Senior Technology Advisor for the World Bank Group. He's also Chief Medical Officer at Accolade. I've spent some time reading this book that he's just done. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. And like it's written like quick chapter after quick chapter. And I think in between each of these, he was seeing patients and people and doing things. So, you know, he's very frenetic and it kind of comes out in this. Uh, but Shantanu's book is called Care After COVID, What the Pandemic Revealed is Broken in Healthcare and How to Reinvent It. It's just out two days ago. Let's send it to the top of the New York Times list. So let me uh, just open our conversation. We're gonna talk and, uh, and I've been told that all of you will be able to post questions, which we will get into as well. Let me ask um, Shatanu just to sort of help set the stage for a moment uh, in this. And you know, when I read a book like this, I have a lot of aha moments, and I said, that makes sense. That makes sense. I understand that 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 the uh, COVID experience has transformed telehealth. People have really gone. We used to talk about going from the analog world to the digital world. In fact, that's been a new new America obsession for two decades. But it's really happened now. And I guess my question to you, and I've always feel this, even when I was at New America many years ago, are we? reacting to circumstances or are we proactively thinking about them? And I, and I have to say that I'm, I'm not sure reading your book where we're at, are we reacting and now we're gonna end up in a be better health ecosystem because of the COVID experience and that's a reaction or should we have gotten a lot of this right before COVID came along? Let's start with you and then we'll jump to uh, Rear Admiral Blumenthal. Does that, does that sound good? Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, thank you so much, uh, New America, for having me, Steve, Dr. Blumenthal, such an honor. Uh, we, in my opinion, were absolutely reactive, right? I mean, there's an old saying, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And I think that's what we've seen, right? We, we were in a once in a century pandemic, and that's what pushed us really to make changes. Changes that I think folks like Dr. Blumenthal have been talking about for a couple decades, but we had a whole host of reasons for why we didn't do it, right? Mm -hmm. We said, oh, well, virtual care can't be, you know, can't be done. There's different workflows, payments very complicated, there's privacy issues, right? But what I saw in my clinic, I still get a chance to practice, like you said, at a safety net clinic, is we went from zero to 80% virtual in two weeks. I never, literally never done a virtual visit before. Mm -hmm. to, to now it's the way I'm providing the majority of the care that I'm doing today. And I think we showed ourselves that healthcare can be way more flexible in a crisis than I think most of us thought. Well, I'm going to go to Dr. Blumenthal because she and I have literally been talking for years about this. The reason I wanted to start with you is to get this notion on reaction because she was thinking about this way before COVID. So I'm going to ask you, Dr. Blumenthal slash Susan, why were we so poor at making some of these platforms and decisions and the nimbleness and being able to meld you know, con conventional needs in healthcare with some things that we've seen, because I know you have been thinking about this a long time. You didn't need a pandemic to get there. Right. Well, thanks again, Steve, for, for moderating this discussion. Welcome back to New America as the founding executive <laughs> vice president. You know, we're so delighted that you're here uh, and, and joining us to talk about the future of healthcare. You know, I, I think uh, the father of medicine, Hippocrates, once said, prevention is preferable to cure. Uh, mm -hmm. I served for two decades under four presidents. We worried about anthrax. Well, we were faced with anthrax. We were faced with H1N1 flu. Uh, each time we're reactive, we'll spend anything once there is an issue, but we don't build the resilient public health infrastructure that's needed. We don't, we don't invest in prevention. You know, we spent only 3% before the pandemic of a $3.5 trillion healthcare budget on government prevention programs. 
we let the um, pandemic, you know, after the Ebola, we, we, we let mm. that pandemic office atrophy um, and we let our global uh, connectivity atrophy. I think that the pandemic, you know, showed multiple weaknesses in America's public health infrastructure. We saw, you know, there was no real-time data surveillance. There was, um, you know, a, uh, a lack of testing, contact tracing, public health communications. You know, we saw that a vaccine availability and production and distribution had not really been thought through on what would happen on, on a mass scale. Um, and uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lack of of a dearth of masks and personal protection equipment and, and this myriad set of websites that, you know, was like the Hunger Games with people trying to find, you know, a, a place for vaccines. Um, and I think that this is just, it was reflective of the fact that we weren't thinking ahead and that we weren't modernizing our healthcare system using digital, um, you know, technologies. We also saw a shameful uh, a set of disparities that had existed for all too long in our healthcare system, but the pandemic shown a spotlight on it in terms mm -hmm. of blacks, you know, Latinx and indigenous peoples having two to three times the infection and death rate as compared to whites and showing that not only was there, you know, a lack of modernization of the public health infrastructure, but also structural racism uh, that existed and an urgent need to prioritize equity and inclusiveness in the, in the design and implementation of medical interventions. So I think a lot of these deficiencies were, were exposed and, 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 and now is the time, you know, we have to race to fix them. Before I jump back to our author of the day, Susan, um, you know, I've, I, I hate to talk about medical people in any partisan sense, but there are some like Dr. Redfield, the former head of the CDC, uh, uh, who, who worked under President Trump, but also many Deborah Burks who was an advisor, but I have interviewed, uh, Dr. Burks, Dr. Redfield, Dr. Fauci, you know, um, celebrities like yourself, Lena Wen, others. And it doesn't matter. All of them said that our underinvestment in public health infrastructure was a chronic and glaring red flag for a long period of time. Yeah. And I'm just wondering whether the passion and drama and needs of this moment are going to fix that or whether you worry that the moment we begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel, we fail to invest again. I, I think it's it's always a worry, Steve. Thank you for raising that. I, I I don't think though we can let this happen once again. You know, if you think about it, I mean, United States is five percent of the global population. We had twenty percent of COVID infections, eighteen percent of the of, of the death rates. How could a global leader in medicine and technology have lagged so far behind in an effective response to the coronavirus until recently? I think that the what has happened though, this era of past neglect, has really um, mobilized multiple sectors of, of of our society: policymakers, technologists, public health professionals, and medical experts to really re-examine the system and you know to to move forward i mean we've seen already you know the reinstatement of the cdc as a as a premier institution uh, we've seen the uh, reestablishment of the office of global health security in the white house that had been disbanded um, and we're you know putting top notch people into positions across the government but we have to make sure that the money is there that we we're not just you know, always begging for public health money, but that we are really making these commitments. And I think you're gonna see a lot of, of um, you know, pressure because as Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it tends to rhyme. You know, we have, people forget that infectious diseases have killed more people than war, and we have to remain vigilant against them. Thank you, Dr. Nindi. One of the reasons I liked your book so much is that it was clear that you're not only a health policy wonk, but you're out in the field. You see people, you have a, uh, a healthcare practice where you see people in the safety net in the greater Washington, D.C. area. As COVID hit, I'd, I'd love you to kind of give us the highlights of, of both the, the, I hate to put it this way, the, but the good and the bad of what you experience as a practitioner, what people, real human beings were experiencing um, both that was good uh, and that was in, that were clear deficits in our healthcare system. Yeah, and I love that question. I think it's so important to orient that way. I mean, I think, look, I, I've had the privilege of working the safety net for almost 10 years now. And, and I'd say that other than launching a patient portal a few years ago, I mean, it really has not changed. And, but during the pandemic, uh, I only get a chance to practice once a week. So it's like, you know, you watch your grandkids grow up 
and you get to see them like every three months. And it was like that for me going to the clinic once a week, it was incredible to see the change, right? From literally it was a waiting room full of people to a completely empty one. We're all virtual to, I come back two weeks later, we have a white tent and we're swabbing people's noses in the white tent to a few weeks later, we're starting to have just a subset of patients be able to come back to we're handing out blood pressure cuffs so that people can drive up. We would hand them a blood pressure cuff and bag and say, hey, we're going to measure your blood pressure from home. I mean, it was the level of change we've seen has been dramatic. And I think that it's been really positive in so many respects, right? You talk about virtual. I mean, virtual was great because care became contactless, right? And that was mm -hmm. important to event, you know, people from spreading infection. But guess what? I saw my no-show rates in my clinic, meaning patients that would have an appointment and couldn't make it drop from 15% to almost zero. And why? Because mm -hmm. for someone who's living on the margins to be able to take a half day of work off, which means that they're missing their wages that day and finding childcare and getting transportation, those barriers were so, so significant that mm -hmm. simply making the care, the visit with me virtual allowed us to bypass that. And you can see how that's beneficial, not just for COVID, but for chronic diseases. Uh, another great example is the way we use data. So we invested in electronic medical record years ago, but we weren't really using the data. But when the vaccine came out and we had protocols to say it's only eligible for these people and then those people and those people, guess what we had to do? We started combing our data to find people of those different risk levels and calling them up out of the blue. So not waiting, being reactive, waiting for them to show up and hoping that they show up. We started calling our patients and saying, hey, you know, we are, we want you to come in for an appointment because you're identified as being higher risk. Well, guess what? That's something that we could use after the pandemic to find people who haven't come in for their diabetes for a year or people who've recently been in the hospital, right? That muscle of taking data and being proactive was big. And the last one was meeting people where they are, like literally, you know, so going canvassing door to doorstep to doorstep in the community, getting people registered for the vaccine, making sure that they have food. Um, all those things are real muscles that we've built. Mm. Um, the, sort of the way I say it is the way that care has been architected itself, which has been completely concentrated in clinics and hospitals, we've re-architected care to mm. be much closer to where people are. And so there's a lot of those positive things. I think the, the negative things the short version of it is we already know all those things, right? I mean, those things, again, like, uh, you know, Susan said have been magnified or accentuated, mm -hmm. right. but as a physician, I mean, I've been seeing that stuff for a long time and it wasn't a surprise in some respects to see those things persist. Well, I'd like to echo what, you know, Dr. Nundi is saying, because I think that, you know, for, for some of us, as you, as you mentioned early on in your, in, in your introduction, Steve, you know, we've been trying to to, to think about ways of modernizing and re-engineering the health system, you know, using technology. Uh, but the the COVID pandemic accelerated the ability to do that. You know, it put yes a magnifying glass on the myriad faults in America's healthcare system. It's mm. in excess in in excess. Uh, ability to be inaccessible, it's on affordability, it's in equity, it's fragility. But as uh, Dr. Nundi said, it also revealed just how flexible the system can be in the time of a crisis. So mm. this once in a century, you know, public health uh, emergency has ushered in a once in a generation, you know, reimagining of healthcare delivery, um, virtual care, digital services that may actually improve patient experiences and, and build more resilient public health infrastructure as Dr. Nundi said, not just for the pandemic, but for the other health challenges, and there are so many that face us now and in the years ahead. I mean, I love and, this. And I'll just add know, one quick yeah. thing, which is, it, it, I agree with everything Dr. Bloom said, and it's not just technology either, because a lot of people out there are saying, well, hey, you know, not everyone has connectivity and device, and all that stuff is true, and been magnified again during the pandemic, but there's a lot of non-technology things, mm. like the drive-through, why is it for the last several decades, we get people that are sick and coughing and sneezing, putting them in a place we literally call the waiting room so they can cough and sneeze on each other just to get a test, right? So the drive-through, which is literally like a white tent with a nurse standing there with a Q-tip is not a piece of technology, but it's an innovation that's been sorely needed, right? Mass vaccination. We know that we don't vaccinate people for shingles. We don't vaccinate people for the pneumovax. The idea of vaccinating them in their homes, in churches, in mass vaccination sites, these are all sort of non-technology innovations too that 
I think we've seen truly scale during the pandemic. And now again, the question is, what do we do with all of that? I mean, you, you were at the beginning of the book trying to talk about how when you were assessing what you were seeing in the early stages of the pandemic, how to set up a plan. You did this a bit with Kavita Patel on how to you know, encourage home testing. I mean, I think one of the questions I want to ask, and I have a second one for you, um, Dr. Nindi, but, but how hard is it to get the healthcare system to be logical? I mean, because I sensed your frustration at the beginning of that, that here was an innovation, it was process, it wasn't ingenious, it was pretty common sense, but you had kind of a you know difficult time with it. Yeah, no, this is a double click on the story a little bit. I mean, yes, you know, back in March, we'll all remember that first month, everyone was obsessed, testing, 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 testing. A colleague, uh, Dr. Kavita Patel and I, just, we were on a phone call and we said, gosh, why can't people just test themselves at home? Mm-hmm. And wrote a piece about that. And I mean, the, the public interest and the interest amongst doctors and patients was enormous. But when we went to sort of the powers that be, broadly speaking, yeah, they had so many questions. They said, well, how are patients going to know like when to get themselves tested? They're going to overuse it. And I said, really? People don't have money to burn and they're not going to, people don't enjoy sticking Q-tips in their noses, right? Mm-hmm. They said, well, how are people going to know how to do this? This is really hard. Only a, only a doctor can, only a healthcare professional can do this. They said, really? Because I remember when I was a medical student and a nurse showed me how to do one and said, go to the next room and do that. That was all, that was all the training I got, right? <laughs> and with the ability to watch YouTube videos, I'm like, come on, people can learn how to do this. And, and then the last one they said is, how can people know the results of the test themselves? Oh, they'll have to understand sensitivity and specificity and how do they interest it? I mean, and, and, and it was, and so, yeah, it, it was frustrating. And, and frankly, we missed a very, very important window right as the pandemic was, was really hitting us hard here to have a much better model, a uniquely American model. We get everything mailed to our house and Amazon boxes these days. Why couldn't we get a test? And of course now, uh, this is not a commercial for any particular company, but you know, my mom flew back uh, from LA. She's vaccinated, we're vaccinated. She came home two weeks ago. She came home from the flight. My, her grandkids aren't vaccinated, my kids are young. And on our kitchen table, for $14, she swabbed her nose 15 minutes later, she got a result and was hugging her grandkids, right? And yet we heard these stories of people spending over a thousand dollars to see a doctor and get a test. Fourteen dollars, you know, people can test themselves with a pretty accurate test. These are the so kind show of that the- again because I haven't seen that before. Oh, like, yeah. I don't care. You know, go ahead and have you, it. you could walk into uh, any, buy any buy CVS or Walgreens now. and get this. Abbott it's, Labs, it's, okay, great. Yeah, it's $20 it, me- for two. <clears throat> And another example you, yeah. was the web was the website. I mean, I built the first website in the government for health. Uh, I was going to get to that. Yeah. 1993. And it's like, you know, um, we, again, there was a lot of resistance. Uh, NIH CDC had nothing online at the time. Mm. We had to build it at the Department of Defense to create a one-stop wow. machine. You know, and so fast forward, here we are again. Um, there's a Byzantine series of websites. People can't. Uh, they have to wait in queue on on the line to find you know a vaccine site. I mean, why didn't we build immediately you know a, a one stop shop for health information, a way to sign up for a vaccine to be in queue and matched in your zip code with a one eight hundred number if you can't navigate the internet? But it's only recently, within the past few weeks, that such a system is coming into place. Uh, that's just inexcusable mm. in the twenty first century. And I think it underscores the need, again, to plan ahead, to have the capability of bringing public health and technologists together. Because if we're going to redesign and reimagine a modern health system for the 21st century, you know, we really need to work together. And it's not just technology. um, it's, It's marrying public health, science, and technology together to create the kind of responsive, effective, efficient healthcare system we need in the 21st century. And that's why I'm working to um, with, with a number of groups to try to create a new field of public health technology that mm-hmm. will um, you know, create a new generation of technologists, I mean, many who've gone into uh, business world, entertainment, uh, worked in the biosciences, but we need them in public health. We need this generation that's been inspired mm-hmm. uh, by wanting to act and respond to this pandemic to help us with the other health challenges that are, are you know with us today and tomorrow. That's terrific. I, lo- I really want to hear more about this Center for Public Health Technologies or initiative. It's a, 
uh, I, I'm fascinated by how quickly things have changed. I think that's what Dr. Nundi was uh, 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 outlining in his book. But let me ask you another dimension. A few days ago, <clears throat> I interviewed uh, someone you know well, um, Susan, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, S Senator Debbie Stabenow mm -hmm. on mental health. And she, she reminded our audience that, you know, your health uh, above the neck is as important as health below the neck. And in your book, you talk about mental health and you talk about this dimension, which is often neglected in public health discussions and in uh, personal health discussions as something that's gotten a real boost in terms of the digital and technology platforms and telehealth that perhaps was unexpected. Can you tell us more about that, Dr. Nindy? Yeah, absolutely. It's such an important topic, as you said. I mean, it, it was really a multiple dimension. The one, so part of my life is I'm chief medical officer of Accolade. It's a company that serves employers. And I'll tell you today, compared to a year and a half ago, I seldom walk into a room with an employer where mental health wasn't, isn't the one, the top one, two or three things that they want to talk about. Hmm. And that's, that's, a massive, massive change from what it was before. And I think a, a testament to the broad awareness and magnification, this groundswell that we have and say, okay, well now what do we do with it? The second is, I think what we learn, and I'll tell you myself, <laughs> one of the first patients I did a video call with, I do a lot of audios. The, the first video call was a woman who, uh, as soon as I got her on the video, I could see she was tearful. And I looked at her for a second and said, I think you work here. And she did, she actually worked at my clinic in a sort of ancillary role. And, and she was tearful and she was telling me about how, you know, she had a new baby, she's a single mother. Uh, her mom would normally help, but she couldn't because of the sheltering in place, but that she dealt with de depression after her first baby as well. And, you know, what I realized was, you know, at, at first, if someone told me, hey, you're gonna take care of someone who's tearful and, and, and emotional over video, I'd say, no way. That's when you need to be at the bedside. That's when you need to hold their hand. But as I saw in this conversation, it's kind of like FaceTime. If you FaceTime with your family members, it's very intimate, actually. Mm. And it wasn't me in my white coat. It was me in my own house with my own messy scribbling walls. And it was her in her home. And I also realized logistically, right, this is a new mother who had to juggle, a, you know, the car seat. And she also was someone that worked in my clinic. Maybe she would face a lot of patients with mental health based stigma. Maybe she would face even more. Because her coworkers say, hey, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm just here to see the doctor, right? And I realized in that moment that had it not been for, for virtual, we may not have had the opportunity to even to, to be with each other, let alone create that sort of close connectivity that in a strange way technology can sometimes do, not always. Um, and then the follow-up. I mean, because for most people with mental health, we know that therapy is a very proven intervention, but that's a very hard intervention to do, right? You're seeing someone one or two times a week for, for several weeks to months. How does that work for, for most even, you know, privileged, uh, you know, uh, folks who have flexibility in their schedules, let alone for people who, whose jobs don't offer a lot of different options. And so, you know, at least in that moment, I saw, and I saw many times since then, really um, the opportunity that, that virtual has, particularly, mm -hmm. In, in mental health. And I think, you know, Steve, thank you so much for raising that issue because, you know, one out of five Americans suffers from, you know, a mental uh, disorder in any year period. And the rates mm -hmm. went up in the pandemic by 40%. So, you know, for, and, and I think, you know, Dr. Nundi, you know, rose some of the issues like inaccessibility, where do you find a therapist? Um, how do you get there? Childcare issues, transportation issues. So for our rural and underserved communities, um, I think virtual services have made a real difference. And, and I think that um, being able to check in with someone frequently, for example, a woman may have postpartum depression, but she's juggling her baby and she doesn't have childcare and she can't get in, but you can check in on her virtually mm -hmm. and see how she's doing. And, and I think all of these things uh, have come together. To, to, you know, it's also a, a, a source of support, uh, having support groups online. And I, I think that um, you know, the brain is a, a great orchestrator and it gets sick just like the heart or the pancreas for diabetes and it manifests in our behavior. And, and I think you know, this integrated system of, of brain and behavior and health mm. um, ha have to be one. And, and I think the virtual world helps us with that. Um, I'm going to tell our audience to keep sending in your questions because I may go to them earlier, which I'm going to do right now because somebody posted a question that I want to ask uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Susan and Shantanu. 
Uh, and the question is, how can we guide policymakers to continue what works regarding telehealth uh, and other issues? And I think this is one of the interesting questions. I don't want to lose our audience, but one of the most controversial um, and important topics inside the health system is payments. And so telehealth is, is covered right now. And there's a lot of concern that, you know, some of the innovation, some of the things we brought along, you know, as we get beyond the pandemic, we may go back to conventional patterns. It may not have the support and the payment system supporting telehealth. Susan, how do you see that? Do we have to worry about that? Or is, is, the, is the progress that we've made in innovations like telehealth solid enough that policymakers will not be silly enough to roll that back? Well, I think we, we do need to remain vig vig vigilant. I worked with the DOD two decades ago trying to push telehealth services and get reimbursement for it, but there were trade issues because physicians mm. and other healthcare providers are licensed by state. And there is now a, a mechanism that's been in put, put in place that allows you to be uh, licensed across states. And this needs to be expanded and given the support that it needs. I think also, you know, we need to have outcomes research. We need to make sure that virtual services work and we need to have the outcomes that will make the justification for uh, continuing um, the payments that are needed. Um, Medicare, you know, loosens its payments. It started to provide uh, payments. We need to make sure there's parity. And I think that, again, policymakers will need to have pressure and keep the pressure on. And I think consumers have an important role to play in lending their voices and letting their policymakers know that virtual services helped and that they should be sustained. Great, Shantu, I wanna ask you the same question, but I'd also ask you to reflect on uh, the dangers of, of going too far one way. There was a section in your book where you talk about you know, a patient that a lot of, you know, people could do telehealth, they could, you know, had symptoms, you could sort of sort out whether uh, 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 people generally should be tested and whatnot. But there was a patient whose oxygen levels were so um, stressed that if that patient were there, that patient might have died. And so there's a, th th there is occasion for uh, in-person visits. So I'd be interested in the trade-offs as you see it. Did we lose? Um, no, I was going to say we're okay. We need to go for hybrid care. You know, I mean, yeah. you don't to replace the in-person visit. That's not mm. the goal. It's really to create a, a hybrid model that helps both the patient right. and the healthcare provider. Doctor Nundi, I see you, you're back. I am. I apologize. Right? Yeah, I was going to speaking of virtual care. So yeah. I was just going to make two, you know, <laughs> somewhat provocative comments. Right? I, I think the first is sometimes I worry that we're going after telehealth a little bit too narrowly. Right. Mm. I think really what we need to do is there's this common principle that I think Susan, I think you would espouse as much as me, which is we have to meet people where they are at home, in the community, at work and online. And that's really what we have to do. But we have a payment system that is location specific. I mean, look, if I see a patient in primary care in my clinic, why should that be different than if I see them in their home? Right. If I can hospitalize a patient in a hospital, why shouldn't I be allowed to provide hospital level care for that patient in their own home? Mm. Or if I'm seeing someone with high blood pressure, why should I not be able to see them and get paid to, to, to take care of their blood pressure in a barbershop if that's where they feel comfortable? This idea that where the doctor is, is somehow uh, connected to whether, whether we get paid, which means whether we can do it, to me is just, is absolutely um, anachronistic. And, and just like in telehealth, we need to open up and this idea of being agnostic to place of service. Um, the second sort of pr provocative point I'll say is that, you know, we can't just take a, a pretty not, I mean, look, let's be honest, most of us that go to the primary care doctor, even in a clinic, it's not a great experience, right? It's the visits are 10 minutes and they don't really have time to, they'll interrupt you within 45 seconds and then you'll leave and then you don't hear from them oftentimes for two to three months. What we can't do is waste this moment and, and take what's a largely broken experience in the real world and make that a largely broken experience virtually, right? What we need to do is say, okay, now that we have the ability to connect with the virtual, how do we just reimagine the whole thing, right? So an example I give is my mom who has had type two diabetes for 25 years and it's been uncontrolled for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And she's been on insulin for 10 years with just increasing doses. During the pandemic, she completely reversed her diabetes, meaning that her sugar is controlled and she's off of insulin completely. 
And how did she do that? Well, it was a virtual service that she signed up for, but it wasn't just, again, taking an in-person visit every three months and making it a virtual visit every three months. No, she was given a 24 seven coach. She was sent mm-hmm. recipes to her home. She had a glucometer that sent data. Um, she was connected to another patient like her who's from India and is vegetarian who could share other tips and tricks that he learned for how to maintain uh, the, 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 the diet that she wanted to follow, right? To the point where a month in, she'd lost 15 pounds and got off of insulin completely. That's what we need to do. We need to take this new, this new possibility and say, how do we need to deliver care differently to Susan's point so that we're actually getting outcomes? Right. And I think that's really, really, really critical because remember, and I, and I want to underscore what, what uh, Dr. Nundi said is that, you know, here we are with some of the most advanced science and technology in the world. But did you know we rank 42nd on life expectancy in the world? We, According to a RAND report, we get the right treatment only 50% of the time. We can't just virtualize that experience. We have to use this pandemic as an opportunity to reimagine, redesign, and re-engineer a healthcare system so that it works better for doctors, patients, uh, and the healthcare system. Susan, how do you do it? I mean, and I don't mean to be facetious about it because I know you're an innovator, particularly in the policy space in government. But when I just listened to uh, uh, Shantanu describe the the wraparound right. um, connectivity that his mother got and how it impacted, and I see it happening in various stuff I'm doing right now, get out and run, you know, who I'm running with, find somebody. We see that in, you know, Peloton and others is that, that these new platforms are being created. But I just sort of feel like the government is a bit of a lag factor in these issues. Mm-hmm. I remember, you know, and just, just to be silly, but in, in a New America board dinner once in the Bay Area many, many years ago, and the topic was how Silicon Valley could help end death. And someone of the Washington type sitting at the dinner said, that's gonna be terrible for entitlements. And so you kind of saw, you know, here's this notion that there's this innovation space out on the West Coast and Washington regulates and Washington is behind. And I'm just interested in how you think when you're talking about this cultural shift and change, we can bring government people along so that they don't impede that innovation that they help drive it. Well, again, I think um, a a really important point, Steve. Um, One of the things I've been working on at New America is how do you modernize our federal food assistance programs, for example? Mm. I mean, we saw during the pandemic, one out of six Americans is hungry. Well, you had a a food system, 53% of all infants are enrolled in the federal WIC program, uh, Mm. and yet they were getting a paper voucher, you know, to give their benefit, which had so much stigma, and um, you lost 68% of people by the end of you know a child's fifth year when they're eligible so you know how do you modernize that program with with technology and i think the pandemic accelerated it it, it, it it's starting to permit online ordering or pick up at the grocery store rather than having to go in and shop uh you know and and so i'm just i i think that this acceleration of the way we're thinking and the redesign um, is, i hope will permeate uh you know our centers of innovation at medicare uh the 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 HRSA system and all of our federal programs will, will be uh, facing a redesign so that they work more effectively for the 21st century. And policymakers, I mean, it's a stimulus response organization. And so if they're stimulated by the consumer saying this is important to them, I think you're, you're going to see more innovation um, in the system moving forward. Dr. Nindi, let me ask you about the state of our medical records today inside health systems and whether they are designed and, and, and compatible with each other enough so that all of the things you're talking about in the digital space, from research to knowing how to personalize healthcare around someone, whether or not, you know, I'm just gonna tell you right out because I don't think our health record system is up to that, that standard, but I would like, love to get your view. And if you agree with me that there's a pretty crappy situation of, the healthcare system within health systems, what can be done to change that so that the world you and Susan are describing can can get a turbo boost? Yeah, no, I love that question. And I think, first of all, I think for folks that, you know, it, it's easy to think, okay, the electronic medical record, that's like, seems like really minutia, but the reality is that piece of equipment or software drives what doctors do and don't do, right? So like when Susan talks about 50% of treatment decisions that are made are, are not 
the right treatment decisions. We're typing that information. We're ordering that prescription in the electronic medical record, right? When we meet with somebody and we don't recognize that they have uh, food insecurity, a lot of times that data may exist somewhere in the electronic medical record, but it's not hitting us over the head. So just for everybody out there, I think just the electronic medical record is really the most scalable way to change the behaviors of healthcare professionals and patients. And so it's a super important topic. And the short answer is no. <laughs> you know, like what we did largely is we took a, a, a paper chart and we scanned it for like a hundred billion dollars. And we said, here's your electronic medical record, right? I mean, I can't even do simple things. Like if you said to me, okay, I should be able to like Gmail search in there to say, find me all my patients with diabetes that's not controlled, enter, create a list. I can't do that today. And it should be interoperable. I mean, you have hospitals and outpatient clinics within one, you know, university setting that they don't interact. And, and again, another key element is that it's going to be very accessible for the consumer so that the consumer has access to their information. And we also have to make it equitable. You know, well, many people, un, you know, under uh, incomes of 30,000 use the internet. We see, you know, many black and brown communities, rural towns and elderly facing the triple threat of a digital divide. They have lack of broadband connectivity, lack of mobile devices and lack of digital literacy. So post pandemic, this digital access will increasingly will equal healthcare access. So as we're talking about the president's infrastructure plan, we have to make sure that broadband access, you know, is part of that because as I said, I mean, and as we're talking about, as digital services become more a part of it uh, and well-designed ones, um, we need to ensure that people have access to it. Susan, do you feel like gravity is going in the right direction now with regard to that? Because, you know, I, I saw firsthand in CVS clinics where I was getting my COVID uh, uh, vaccination that you know, I saw, I'll, I'll never forget, I saw an older elderly black gentleman telling the, the young uh, uh, clerk, I can't get on the internet. I don't know how to get on the internet. I tried to call the 1-800 number there, but I would have given up my, I mean, if I, I would have just said, take this person now right. and bring them in. I sort of feel like we're talking about broadband connectivity. Here's somebody walked in. I sometimes feel like that individual who's trying his or her best who is from one of those marginalized communities still trying to get over it, that somehow our system hasn't figured out how, how to be effective and have heart. Well, I think, I think that's so right and, and such an important point. I mean, we have to have hybrid models. It's not all digital. It's not all in person. There needs to be a way that everybody can access that we're, when we're designing, we're thinking about all communities and how various you know, marginalized groups of people or people with who don't have digital act can, can access the system too and how we can find them. And I think that's also what Dr. Nundi talked about, about bringing care to, the, to people. You know, people were going door to door to help identify people who hadn't been vaccinated uh, or healthcare providers. I, I think 1-800 numbers are useful, but let's make sure they have enough operators so you're not put on hold for two hours. And, and I think, and make sure that they're in multiple languages. And I think that these are things that we must demand uh, going forward um, to make sure that things are designed for everyone to be inclusive. And yeah, I was just saying, yeah, I completely agree with everything. And I would say that it, we have to start measuring the experience uh, of care, right? When I got to my, my current role at Accolade, having been in the healthcare system for a long time, I, I was in meetings that kept saying ASA, ASA, and CSAT and CSAT. And I thought, oh, ASA was like aspirin because for, for doctors, mm. ASA is like an abbreviation. It means average speed of answer. And CSAT is customer satisfaction. We measure at the end of a lot of our calls our satisfaction, just like you would do in a lot of other industries, but not healthcare, right? And so when we talk about moving to value-based care, which is a super important uh, effort, a lot of the way we're measuring value though, goes back to the sort of the measures of quality that you know, might matter to a doctor or to a health system, but not necessarily the ones that also matter to people. Like I think that story you gave Steve so poignant. But the question is, how do we just, you know, like Nordstrom's put everything aside and say, sir, I'm here to help you. Mm -hmm. How do I just make this easy? But if we don't incentivize that in the way that we pay for care and the way that we measure care, I don't feel like people are going to be on the, today at, at where I work, a portion of our dollars go back to the customer. If we don't hit our uh, satisfaction and, and, and ASA targets, we have to mm -hmm. literally give money back. 
I'd love to see health systems have to give money back when they don't treat patients the way they should be treated. Mm -hmm. Do you, think, go sorry. ahead, please. I also think, Steve, you know, your, your comment really underscores something else that we need to think about in medicine, the, the intersectionality of issues, the, the sociocultural determinants of health. You know, one third of deaths in our country are linked to issues like poverty, lack of education, um, and, and structural racism. And so as we go forward and we think about redesigning the healthcare system, you know, you can treat someone in the hospital, but you send them home, they don't have a place to, to live. They don't have adequate food on the table. They don't have transportation or childcare. Um, you're gonna see them back in the hospital within a week, a few weeks. And, and so when we're designing, when we're redesigning and reimagining this healthcare system, we have to think about these other factors, addressing the inequities and inequalities that have existed in the healthcare system, making sure you know, that housing and food security, that they're all part of the way we think about healthcare in the 21st century. You know, I, 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 I really- I an example on that real quick, Steve, okay. if you don't mind, like how to do that? Because I think it's, Susan, how do you do that? I remember this patient of mine who was in and out of the hospital with heart failure. And one of the things that you have to do to prevent heart failure is you have to check your weight. And if your weight's up a couple pounds, you take another, um, uh, you know, extra dose of medication or call your doctor. So after one of these hospitalizations, I was talking to this patient. I said, I said, you know, uh, remember, check your weight every day. And then I left the room. And then as soon as I left, I thought, what if she doesn't have a scale? So I went back in and I asked her, I said, do you have a scale? And she was very embarrassed to say, no, doctor, I, I don't because I can't afford one. And I looked around the clinic. We didn't have any extra ones. I gave her $20 on my pocket, uh, which by the way is, is like, again, some sort of rule. Um, and, and, and she never got admitted to the hospital again. And, and this is the idea that, look, if I wanted to order her a CAT scan for $1,000, I could do that. If I, if I wanted to hospitalize her and run up a $10,000 bill of a cardiac catheterization and a treadmill test and three days in the hospital, I could do that. But if I wanted to give her or wanted to get $20 for her to get a weighing scale, I can't do that. And so I think the way to do that is rather than a broad blanket programs, which is most of the way that we're building policy, what we should do is say, how do we give more resources to the front lines, to the people who are actually with the patient to say, hey, this one needs a $20 scale. This one needs a transportation voucher using Lyft or Uber. This one needs uh, you know, a, place, uh, a place to sleep at night. We're the ones in the room with the patient and understanding what they need, give us the resources to make those determinations. And when you do that, what we saw, if you look at clinics like Oak Street in Chicago, who actually get resources, they get a large share of the premium dollars for their patients, that's how they're financed. They did amazing things. They went from taking, having mobile vans that brought patients to their visits to they turn the mobile rounds, vans around and they started delivering food and medications to people's homes. And so rather than this kind of one size fits all saying, well, everyone needs virtual or everyone needs this or everyone needs that, why don't we give the resources to the people closest to care and en enable them to be able to decide how to allocate those resources to solve those core barriers and challenges that our patients face. It's really great framing that you have brought to this. And I'm so happy, Susan, that you talked about the systemic racism in the system. I remember when I was at the Atlantic, my colleague Olga Kazan wrote uh, an article about the greater Baltimore area and the 20 year life expectancy difference between different parts of town mm -hmm. and that you could look from one another. So we did a big health forum there. Lena Wen spoke at it. We had lots of health poobahs come in, lots from Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. But what you really got, and we brought in real people who were trying to navigate that health system uh, from these marginalized communities. And what became clear is there were a lot of earnest people who wanted to do better, but you could feel the cards were stacked against them. And you could feel that they felt that those institutions were indifferent towards them. And there was no social trust. They didn't see black doctors. They didn't see black interns. They didn't see themselves in the system. And so there's an absence of, of trust at that, at that level which I think is going to require somebody to take 20 bucks out of their tip pocket and say, hey, here's a scale. I mean, I'm just sort of interested. I mean, I know we're talking about what we can deal with, but to change gravity in some of the worst places in the country, you're going to have to get institutions to behave differently. Your thoughts on that, Susan? 
Well, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, it's shocking. You don't have to go to the developing world to find a 20 year life expectancy differential. You find it in, in a city like this and in communities across America, right here, right here in the United States. And, and I think that trust is one of the most important factors. We're seeing it with vaccine uh, hesitancy in the sense that you know, who is the influencer that is going to help you? And how do you involve communities in the design? Top down does not work. Um, you know, if we're going to affect change, we need to bring in community advisors. And we found with, you know, we're funding in, in Africa through the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, community mm. health workers, you know, to go around and to someone like you, but a little bit wiser who brings you information and, and helps create a, a local system of care. We need that in the United States of America. We need community health workers who are empowered to help communities to build the trust and build bridges between the healthcare uh, universities and academic centers and the communities which they mm. serve. Great. We have a question from the audience um, for both of you. It says, an influential primary care physician, Margaret McCartney, recently tweeted how providing remote care is harder, feels riskier, less chance to build relationships. Does telehealth contribute to physician burnout? Dr. Nundi? It's a great, great question. I think that the answer is it depends on how it's designed, right? I mean, I think, look, in the worst case scenario, the worst kind of telemedicine we can do, right, is audio only. You address the patient's acute issue, which is, you know, their, their sinusitis or their back pain, and you tell them to go get a prescription somewhere else, and you hang up the phone, and you don't never follow them. That's not what we need, right? But if you can actually create a space, you know, sometimes we call it now the new website manner, right? You're doing a video call. You're, you're being able to have enough time because both the doctor and patient are saving time from having to do a lot of the logistics in a clinic. You're able to address their urgent issue, but then get to know them as a person. Maybe they have their family there because it's easier for families to join when it's, when it's virtual. Maybe you get a, a, a sense of their home environment, which like Susan said, is critical to understanding uh, who a person is. Um, where it's flexible. Like if, look, if you decide during that visit that, hey, there's something missing here and I actually need to see them in person, that you have the ability to convert it to an in-person visit, whether it's in their home or in your clinic, right? So I think that, that it's really about how we design it. And I think that's this sort of, going back to this moment we're in, Steve, is, 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 is it, it is a catalytic moment. And it's a catalytic moment where we can make some really bad decisions that will have repercussions for years, you know? Because like you said, we tend to be reactive. We have this reactive moment the question is, what are we going to use it to really move care forward and reinvent it? Or are we going to have it be more of the same? Or actually, are we going to make some aspects of it worse? Susan? Well, I, I think that's um, the case. I mean, I think we have a once in a century opportunity to redesign America's healthcare system with uh, you know, marrying technology and public health and medicine uh, with some new transformational approaches that you know, make care more accessible, uh, give more resources to the healthcare providers um, that focuses on the patient, moves care from the hospital to the home and emphasizes the power of prevention uh, to address uh, COVID and the many other healthcare challenges and, and opportunities that, that lie. Susan, we, ha we have two questions that are right in that same space and I'm sure. gonna link them and start with you and move to Shantanu. And it says, what kinds of technologies or innovations in care can we expect to make an impact in the post pandemic era for other healthcare challenges? Essentially, what can we do that applies to other stuff? That's part one. Part two is what's the most important lesson we've learned during this pandemic that will revolutionize healthcare long in the future. So I'd love you to take a swing at both of those and ask Shantanu to do that because I think it builds into that question of what do we need to build that's not there? Well, I think the one, one thing, one lesson is, you know, as I said earlier, that history tends to, it doesn't repeat itself, but it tends to rhyme, that we have to remember the public health lessons of the past and, and marry them with the, the tools of technology and science and, uh, and, hum, and social sciences to really address future challenges. And, um, and I think that, um, uh, you know, that, that will, will move us forward significantly. Um, tell me your, your second question. I think the second question is, what is the most important lesson think, we've learned that can be useful well into the future? 
And I, and I think some of the technologies that we're, we're talking about are, you know, um, as, as Dr. Nundi talked about, you know, home monitoring. Um, you know, it's, you, you can measure your blood pressure. You can see, you can do dermatologic checks. You can uh, do eye checks. I mean, all of this can be sent through computers. You can mm-hmm. ask for social supports. There can be home testing. Um, I, I think that we're trying to, there will be, you know, blood markers uh, that can be done from home. So I think all of these things will be helpful. And I think social support and bringing the, the healthcare provider to you uh, is very important because of all the barriers that exist to get to the hospital, to get to the clinic. Um, mm-hmm. and, and again, the lesson, um, you know, that is, is that we really, from infectious diseases, that they've killed more people than war, and we have to remain vigilant against them. For the chronic disease pandemic, that many of the lessons of building a resilient public health infrastructure, um, we we have to invest in it today so that it will work for us tomorrow, not just for Mm -hmm. the pandemic, but for all the other chronic diseases that will affect us now and in the future. Shantanu, your thoughts on both of those? Uh, I I love these questions. You know, what I really think that is sorely missing is we don't have a vision for where healthcare needs to go, right? The closest thing might be people say, well, we need Medicare for all or some version of that. And that's super important. We need everyone in this country to have health insurance affordably and no question about it. But those are health financing questions. What we haven't done is actually say, what's our vision for how healthcare should actually work, right? Like two weeks ago on a Saturday night at 7 p.m., my daughter, who's seven, uh, started having trouble breathing, something she's never had happened to her before. And, you know, like two worried parents, even though we're both doctors, right, we're sitting with her, we're doing the Vicks vapor rub and turning on the steam in the, in, in the shower and trying Zyrtec and other over-the-counter remedies. And at some point, we're scared. And we're looking at our daughter and saying, oh, my God, like, what do we do? And that's the moment, that's the moment where healthcare happens, Right. That's the moment. And yet the entire healthcare system starts when you walk into an ER or walk into a clinic or walk into a hospital. It doesn't start the moment that you have two really scared parents looking at their daughter and saying, what now? And I think what we need to do is, is really have a very clear vision. Uh, and that's what I've tried to outline, you know, is to say care needs to be distributed. It needs to meet people where they are at home, in the community, online. It needs to be digitally enabled. We need to use technology and data to actually strengthen relationships, the most important relationships in healthcare. And we need to to decentralize. We need to give way more resources to frontline workers and to to patients like my wife and I staring at our daughter to figure out what to do next. Because instead what we had is we started calling up our doctor friends, figured out what medication she needed to be on, right? When I called her clinic, they said, call 911. And after that, it said, call your health plan, (laughs) right? And then when we figured out what medication to get, then at eight o'clock at night on a Saturday, where were you gonna fill the medication? So we're looking online, we're finding a bunch of 24 hour pharmacies. We call them, guess what? It's not the pharmacy that's 24 hour, it's the store, right? Right. And after multiple calls, so these are the moments where healthcare happens and we need to have a very clear vision so that all the things that Susan said, the remote monitoring and the home testing, all those things, yes, and AI and all that stuff, but it needs to have a very clear, what is it we're trying to get to? And what we've learned as a country, I think one of the great things is look at how fast we mobilize the the vaccination, right? Mm -hmm. It's still not as good as it could be. And there's lots of mistakes, but I mean, compared to where we were in January to where we are now, it's, it's lightning difference. And I think a huge part of it, Steve, was because we put a marker down. We said, look, the vision is we're gonna get to X million shots by Y date. And that mobilized a whole of sector approach to say, this is what we have to do. So I'd love us to say, hey, by 2030, we want 30% of hospitalizations to be at home. By 2025, we want 10% of people with diabetes to reverse their diabetes and get off medications completely. But Mm -hmm. we can do that. We can set those markers, create real urgency, and accountability, and then mobilize a whole of sector approach consistent with the vision for where healthcare has to go for people, for normal everyday people who are in the rooms with their children figuring out what to do. That's the level of granularity at which we need to define what healthcare should look like. Well, that's that's well, great. Emma, Just as we wrap up, I want to go to Susan and, and Susan, you can throw whatever else you want to do, do in there, but I want to I get this element there because when I heard, oh, you're working on another website, and I know I respect your website, so then I've got, we need another website. But, but you're involved with something called beatthevirus.org, which I think reflects that urgency 
that Shantanu just talked about and is cool. And by the way, yes, I can, you know, it's public record, you know, Susan Blumenthal happens to be married to Senator Ed Markey and I watch his TikTok videos. I mean, Ed is really cool on TikTok. And so part of it is, how do we, you know, when you talk about getting people where they're at, you know, it's, they're not all going to be watching MSNBC or Fox or CNN. Very, very few Americans actually overall watch those. So it's, it's going to these other places, finding them in other spots. And I have to tell you, while you've been talking, I've been kind of clicking through beatthevirus.org, which is really quite cool. So can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of these platforms and also the vibe of them in terms of drawing people in? And we'll, we'll have you both comment uh, and end there. Susan? Okay. Well, thank you. Well, I think it's uh, the, the pandemic really showed the importance of partnerships. When, um, when, when it hit, um, I was working with the MIT Media Lab and you know we wanted to do something and so building the website getting out proven public health messages because there you know at the beginning of the pandemic it was like 1918 all over again we didn't have vaccines then we all we had were proven public health messages we reached out to the entertainment community and sure enough we had 600 million media impressions within a few months um, using celebrities and athletes to get our messages out we've now built it out as a resource hub and using the social media platforms. But I think there are so many ways to get information to people. I encourage those on the call to, to check out beatthevirus.org and to share it with your constituents and friends and, and family. But you know, we need to find other ways to reach people. Not everyone is gonna you know, get the message the, the way we do. And, and finally, you know, Louis Pester once said, chance favors the prepared mind. I think we, you know, going forward, need to remember the lessons from this pandemic we need to, you know, as I said earlier, marry them with public health and science and be innovative, uh, bring together public health technology, design experts um, and, um, and, and medical ones to really reshape and reimagine the future for health. Um, because as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the first wealth is health. And we've learned that so well during this pandemic. Shantanu, last thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think maybe I'll end with how we started. I think, Steve, your question about proactive versus reactive, right? If you look at just our personal lives, right, a lot of us have reflected on how there's been silver linings for us, right? The, the family dinners, the, you know, uh, learning how to cook, slowing down, the less travel. And I think at some point, as we start to get back to normal, we're going to have to ask ourselves, well, which of those things do we want to sustain? And which of those things that we want to continue to accelerate? And that's really the moment we're in now. I really believe that healthcare at the true front lines has changed more in the past 12 months than it has in any 12 months in its modern history. And that's thanks to a reaction, a reaction to a global pandemic. And the next phase of this is on us, right? We have to decide, and I, and I say we in the broadest sense possible, um, patients, doctors, policymakers, technologists, and it, we have to decide where we want to go with this now. And I think what we need is that shared vision and what we need to act with urgency because we know just like the bad habits of not having dinner around the table together are going to creep back in once we're all flying around and doing different things, the same thing is going to happen on healthy. In fact, it's already happening. And so we have this very narrow critical window to really move the system forward. And so I would just welcome everybody here to roll up their sleeves with us and help us take that next step. Well, listen, I want to tell our audience that if you go to the right hand chat uh, box, it should be the, you can click chat and come over there. You have lots of cool links. There's a link to where you can uh, purchase uh, Dr. Nundi's new book uh, through New America's uh, Partner Solid State Books. There's also a terrific, I'm not biased because of this, uh, an op-ed that the two co-wrote uh, in an op-ed on the future of healthcare in a post uh, uh, pandemic world. Uh, that ran in the Hill uh, on Friday, and the link is there. There's also a link to um, beatthevirus.org. So all of that is available to you. I just want to say a big thanks to uh, Rear Admiral Susan Blumenthal, who's the director of the Health Innovations Lab at New America, and Dr. Shantanu Nundi, uh, who's got so many titles, chief medical officer, actually, but the only thing we really care about today uh, is he is author of Care After COVID. Thank you both uh, for joining us, and thank you all for joining New America today. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. It was great. Really a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you guys.